Well, welcome to church, everybody. Would you put your hands together and welcome our Bell Chase location for joining us for church today. We're so excited to have you with us. We're excited to share God's word. Most of you know that the grand opening is actually next Sunday, but we've got all of our leaders and our team there today. They're making sure that everything's going to work the way it's supposed to work. If you're new to our church environment, maybe you haven't heard about this. We adopted a church last year, and we've really grafted them in as a part of our family. And next weekend, we're becoming one church in two locations right here on Paris Avenue and then also in Bell Chase. And I'm really excited for what God is doing in this new journey. Just yesterday, put the sign on the building. Can we give God some praise for that? Pretty excited for that one hope in Bell Chase. I think it's going to be a fun season to see what God does, not only in our lives, but through us as we serve and care. And just want to say a big happy new year to all of you. The first Sunday is a big deal to me. And next week, because we're launching the campus next week, we will begin a brand new series together that we're simply titling Big Rocks. We're going to look at how King David, uh, he drew out some smooth stones and he had them in his life. And those rocks were, gave him the ability to defeat the enemy in his life. And next uh, few weeks, we're going to be talking about how to build some things, some big rocks. Make sure that your life is in an order that God can use you and your life to make a difference. And how about we knock back the enemy just a little bit in this new year? I also want you to know that if you look in your seat backs, you'll find some new cards. We have, why don't you grab a couple of those? We've replaced our standard worship guide with some message notes so that you can uh, write down what the pastor says today and got a little information on the back of that. It's pretty simple, but you also notice a connection card tells you a lot about what we do. Coffee, kids, mothers, room, students, if you've got questions, but because we are beginning 21 days of prayer, I'd love for every one of you to take a look at the, the welcome home side of the connection card. There's some detailed information, but the big deal is the prayer request card for the next 21 days. We as a church are going to be praying together and asking for God to do miracles in our lives. Anybody here believe God still does miracles? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, I still believe God does, right? And and he loves when we ask him and we invite him and we petition him to do those miracles in our lives. And so if you only do one thing today... Would you make sure to fill out the prayer request card? And as you go, you drop it in one of the buckets by the doors. And every single day, both here and in Bell Chase, we're going to be praying over your requests and asking God to do miracles. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, If two or three of you agree touching any one thing, God will do it for you. Now, I know sometimes we pray prayers and it didn't happen the way we thought or as quickly as we thought. Here's what I know. God's timing isn't always our timing. But when God said he will do it, come on, everybody, won't he do it, right? He will do it for us. And so take some time to let us know what you're believing God for in 2024. And we're going to ask God to do that in your life. Now, as we begin this new year, this time of the year really is it's special for me, not just because of where we as a church, but what we're doing in, in launching this ministry in, in the world, that we're actually reaching out and caring for another church, but we're also growing our church. I always reflect in the new year about how we began. 21 days of prayer is what Amber, my wife, and I did as we considered whether we would launch a church in the city of New Orleans. If you haven't heard our story, both of us are born and raised here But we started pastoring for many years in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. We were there for almost 10 years and won 21 days of prayer in January 2013. We started feeling like God was leading us to plant a church so maybe we would step out and do something new. Now, the church there was doing really, really well. How many of you have ever been a part of something that was really succeeding and then you just didn't want to leave? Anybody been there? Anybody? Like, it's going really, I was kind of like, you know, God, this is working. You know, like, uh, I'm okay. I like my office. Anybody, right? Like the people I work with. But we started feeling this sense that God was leading us to step out and to kind of take a big risk and, and believe God to do something here the same as he was doing there. And so we went to our pastor and said, you know, Pastor Chris, would you join us in these 21 days? We're believing, we're feeling like God's leading us to do this, but 
We also feel like it could be just the bad pizza we had last night. I could be going crazy. Maybe, maybe this isn't something we should not do. And I just simply said to him, if, you're, if you won't bless us and encourage us to do it, I, I'm not sure. I think God needs to speak to you and us. I, need God, I think God needs to reveal it to you and us. And three weeks later, after we prayed, he came back and confirmed that we were crazy <laughs> and said that he thinks we ought to step out and plant a church. And he said these simple words to us. He said, you know what? I believe that God will give you a supernatural love for a city. That you'll go to a city and you'll see that city for what it could be, not for what it is. That you'll begin to look through what I call rose-colored glasses. And I tell you, that fall, we came back Thanksgiving of 2013, and we drove around here with some of our staff that are here, and I, I took them on the roundabout at Causeway and Airline, you know? And, and just to have a little fun, I went a couple times around just to scare them a little bit. I want to make sure they knew what they were getting into when they decided to move here and help us to plant a church. But in 2013, that Thanksgiving, can I tell you, I began to have dreams and vision for what God could do here if we would just step out and trust him. And so we took the big risk and we moved back May 1st of 2014. Many of our staff members raised their own support like Carrie Norris and Jackie McDonald and Corey Foshi. A lot of our early staff members that are still on the team and serving in the church with us, they were here. They, they went and raised their own salary. Can you imagine? I'm going to leave a full-time job. I'm going to raise money. I'm going to risk everything and move to this city. Now, y'all know like, I'm from here, so I knew what I was getting into. Some of them didn't know how crazy New Orleans can be, right? And so we took this big leap, and we launched the church. We had about 100 people join the launch team. And on launch day, 381 people showed up to the first service. To God be the glory, right? And what they tell us as you study church planning is about half will like it, and half will not like it, and so half came back the following Sunday, but I'll tell you what, all of them stayed for the donuts that we had on the launch day. A week before we launched, we sent out thousands of mailers, invitations to every mailbox in the city, and during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, we prayed over those mailers every time that when people would open their mailbox, they'd get this little, hey, we're starting a new church in the city. Here's what it's going to look like. Come check it out. That they would have just this divine moment where they would say, you know what? I'm supposed to do that. I, I need to go check this thing out. Well, we prayed over it, and God did some amazing things. And here we are nine and a half years later. And you know what's happening this week on Monday? Mailers are going out all over the West Bank in Bell Chase to invite people to come to church. And we're praying in these 21 days in this next week that, that when people hold that card, they're going to say, this is my invitation. And I thought since we're beginning a season of prayer that we would just stop right here and we'd do the very same thing that we did nine and a half years ago. Would you join me in prayer? Come on, Heavenly Father, we lift up this new opportunity that we have together in Bell Chase. God, we thank you that thousands of people are getting an invitation this week to show up. And God, I pray that their hearts would be drawn in. God, that they would experience your presence in a life-giving way. That they would know you're calling them to be a part of something new. God, we bless this city and the surrounding areas. And God, we ask that you would open the windows of heaven and you would pour out blessing upon our lives. God, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me. And please, for the next few days, if you would pray with us, believe that God's going to just really uh, uh, make sure that everything goes the way it's planned. Because sometimes, sometimes the enemy does not like when you start something new. Y'all know that, right? I, I, I don't think the devil's real fond of anybody planting a new church. Do y'all? I think, I think we need to bathe it in prayer to the best of our ability. Now, for most of my Christian life, I'm 45 years old now. I've been pastoring for 25 years. For most of my Christian life, God has led me through a revelation. God has shown me something through prayer, just a, a picture of what could be, and it's always, I've always followed that revelation. To show you this today, I want to help you to understand that God wants to give you a revelation about 2024. He wants you to start the new year knowing that he has something for you. He, I want you to have a revelation more than your reasoning. 
I want you to know that God is speaking to you. To show you this, we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 1. So grab those message notes, write down some things today. Ephesians 1 and 17 on every screen, it says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom, and say it with me, wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The word enlightened is the word fotizo. It's where we we like have a mental picture. I pray that you would have a mental picture in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The Apostle Paul says, I I, I need you to have a revelation so that you will know him better, so that you will know hope again, so that you will know the riches of his inheritance. How many of y'all know God has an incredible inheritance prepared for us? And also his incomparably great power, his incomparable power for us. Paul says, "I, I I need you to get a revelation of this. I need you to see what God wants to do in your life. What is a revelation? Write it down with me. A revelation is simply when God gives wisdom, insight, and understanding to your life. When God gives you a revelation, it's kind of like an aha moment. The light bulb goes on. You're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was supposed to do that. Maybe it showed up in a dream. Maybe it showed up in a conversation. Maybe you were praying and reading your Bible. Maybe you were just asking for God. But there's this moment where you knew that God was actually leading you in that direction. I think this is one of the most important parts of a Christian's life, that you shouldn't just do what other people are doing. You shouldn't reason your way through life, that you should actually seek for God to give you a revelation. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting... While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, I love, I love those four words. Would you read it with me? The Holy Spirit said. I believe that God still speaks, especially to those who are listening, that he will actually reveal himself to you. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, They placed their hands on them and sent them out. They prayed over them, and then they sent them out to do what God called them to do. Simple question for you today. It's one that I find is resonating in so many of our lives. It's like, what are we supposed to do this year? What am I supposed to change? How am I supposed to grow? What direction should we go? What should I do with my life? What on earth am I here for? Well, can I just tell you, instead of trying to reason your way through or reading the latest self-help book or going to somebody else and saying, what do you think I should do with my life? How about we pray and seek God? Amen, everybody? How about we say, God, would you reveal to me what I should do with my life? And that is why right in the middle of Mardi Gras season, some of y'all like, can't believe you're calling a fast. Listen, listen, listen. It's the first month, and regardless of how all those other things say, how they go and what date they're on, God deserves our first and our best. Amen, everybody? And so for the next 21 days, they're going to put it up on screen, just the details. We've got 21 days of prayer and fasting, January 7th through 27th. There will be prayer services Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And Saturday, everybody say 9 a.m., praise God, 9 a.m., get to sleep in on Saturdays. And Sunday services, we will pray together during our normal times. For the next 21 days, we're saying, God, I need a revelation. For the next 21 days, we're saying, God, I don't want to reason my way through this new year. I want to do what you've called me to do. And there's something about setting aside time to talk to God and actually fasting some things, and I'll talk about that more in just a moment, that allows you to hear from God in a special way. And so as we go into this season, I want to challenge you to try to be a part, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. If you say, Pastor, that's right when we're getting the kids ready for school and I can't get out, well, you can live stream the prayer service. 
For the last nine and a half years, we pray along with thousands of other churches, and my pastor, Chris Hodges, will be leading us in prayer together. You can join us in person right here. You can live stream at home if you need, and even if something happens, you can watch it later in the day. But here's what I'm challenging you to do. Give God your first and your best. Decide that for these next 21 days that you're going to honor God by seeking Him instead of telling God what you're going to do. How about we present to God our lives and say, God, what should we do? That's just simply praying. Now, when we talk about fasting, some of you kind of are intimidated about the idea, but there are four types of fasts that we find described in the Bible. They're going to put all four of them on the screen for you right now. Let me take just a moment to teach you about this, but... If you want more detail than what I give you today, go to onehopechurch.com and click on 21 Days, and there are like lots of resources and messages to teach you more about fasting. There are four ty- types of fasts in the Bible. The first is a complete fast. Jesus did it for 40 days. Praise God, we're not doing that, right? Uh, 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 Moses did it for 40 days. They, they went only water. And it's kind of a a supernatural thing. If you're considering a complete fast, I would say you ought to talk to your doctor about that if you're going to go beyond one day of just drinking water. If you're going to go two or three days or a week, which the most I've ever done is, is about a week or so, I would encourage you to be healthy. I would encourage you to seek God. And, and just lean into like what you should do with that. That's the one extreme. How many of y'all say, count me in for that? <laughs> that one honest person said, no, and I heard you. It's a tough one. The next is what we call a partial fast. A partial fast is where you might say, I'm not going to eat anything from sunup to sundown. I'm going to take a, a particular part of time, or every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm going to go 24 hours, and I'm going to fast. Now, in our culture, this has been popularized as a cleanse, right? You need to cleanse some of those toxins out of your body. Do you know that God is the one who came up with this? And it does both the physical and the spiritual. Some of you do need some physical toxins out of your body, but there's some spiritual things you need to let go of. Amen, everybody? There's some things that are in there. And so I recommend mostly a partial fast or a Daniel fast, which is the third where you would say, for the 21 days, I'm going to give up choice foods. I'm going to give up the things that I would prefer. I'm going to, I'm going to lay aside all the sweets, and, and maybe you're going to hold off to that king cake that would be delivered on the end of the fast, you know? I know I'm pressing some of y'all, but every once in a while, you need somebody like me to come press a little bit and say, God is worthy of our first and our best. So there's a complete fast, a partial fast. There's a Daniel fast. All of these are good for your, number four, your soul. Uh, A soul fast is when you decide to give up the news for 21 days or log out of your social media for 21 days. A soul fast is like, I'm going to hit pause on all the negative relationships in my life and I'm going to make sure that everything that comes in for the next 21 days is going to be all about God. I had one person say, I'm giving up rock and roll for 21 days, just going to listen to worship. Had one guy tell me he's giving up weed for 21 days. I think that's something you ought to consider doing, right? (laughs) You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised that when you fast, here's what you're doing. You're saying to yourself, my body doesn't call the shots. What fasting does is it takes your body out of the driver's seat. So many of us are cravings led. Hungry right now. Anybody hungry? Don't tell me right now. Don't tell me. It's the first day of the fast, all right? Don't tell me what you're eating today. Uh, We all have this process where our bodies are trying to tell us what to do. Fasting is about setting aside your cravings and and you're pushing down your, your body telling you what to do and you're elevating your spiritual life And it's amazing that when you push back on your physical needs and you lean into your spiritual needs, how you hear God more clearly. Almost nine out of 10 Christians, when surveyed in the United States and in the world, still say, I don't really know what my purpose is in life. Well, can I just tell you that if you will... Set aside your body calling the shots and lean into God for a season maybe like you've never leaned in before. That quite possibly what will happen is you'll stop hearing all the negative voices and you'll hear God's voice more clearly. 
Today's message is all about stirring you to lean into God, actually giving you a revelation for your life. You need to know that God is leading you to do some things. You can't live your life just doing what somebody else said or just doing what the pastor said. You need a revelation out of God's word. Amen, everybody? You need to pray and believe that God has spoken to you. Now, you say, well, how does God do that? Well, as you read your Bible, you see that he does it in many different ways. One of the coolest ways I find is that God will reveal himself through dreams. When Joseph was betrothed to Mary, the Bible says that he found out she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I don't want any part of this. But then the Bible says that while he was asleep, an angel came to him in a dream. And the angel spoke to him that he should take Mary to be his wife. And he was was at peace in his heart because of the revelation that God gave him. Sometimes God speaks to you through a dream. Sometimes you'll read the Bible and the words will illuminate off the page. That's why I want to encourage you every day to read the Bible. If you say, where should I start? Go to onehopechurch.com, click on One Year Bible. You get one proverb, you get one psalm, a little bit of the New Testament, a little bit of the Old Testament, a little devotional, takes you 10 minutes, but you're giving yourself the opportunity for God to speak to you and to reveal to you what he wants you to do with your life. Some of you are like, well, pastor, this is what I want. Well, if you've tried everything else and you still haven't heard from God, maybe this is one of those seasons where you say, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm getting out of the bed 6 a.m. I'm going to show up. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to reveal himself to me. I'm challenging you as a church that in the next 21 days to find a new routine of seeking God, do the best you can with the time you have, and then if you can say, well, pastor, I can't make Monday through Friday, come on Saturday, do something so that God will give you wisdom, insight, and understanding. As I was preparing for this message I was reading some of the historical accounts of moments where different historical characters had a moment where God revealed himself. And I tell you, some of the craziest things happen. Do you know that there's one point in the Old Testament that that God revealed himself to a prophet through a donkey? Y'all thought Shrek came up with the idea. (laughs) But Shrek stole it from the Bible. There was actually a moment where a prophet was riding and he didn't realize that he was going in the wrong direction. Balaam, I like the old King James language, but I'm not going to use it for the kids in the room today. But he was riding on a donkey and he was trying to go and the angel stood in the way and the donkey actually was allowed to see the angel. I find this so amusing, isn't it? Some of y'all need to take the limits off of what God can do. And just simply say, if he still does miracles, and if he did it in the past, he could do it again. In Matthew chapter 16, we find this moment with Jesus and the disciples, and we're going to pick up the story together. Read along with me. In Matthew 16 and verse 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Can you just, just for a moment, just imagine that God is asking you personally. But what about you? What about you? What, what, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, come on, read it with me, every voice. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. Changes his name immediately. You go from Simon, son of John, I tell you, you are Peter. Come on, read it with me. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Everything that happens in our lives begins with a revelation of who Jesus is. If you want to change, if you want to grow, if you want to begin a new life in Christ, you have to see him as the son of God and the savior of the world. Amen, everybody? You've got to lift your eyes to see who he is. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't Jeremiah or Elijah. He is the son of God. When you get this revelation, you then say, okay, well, where do I go from here? If you're God, what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm going to give you four things today, practically, that will help you begin this journey. Write them down with me. What should you do once you reveal that Jesus is the Son of God? The first thing you should do, number one, is you should start praying for more revelation. I'm asking you in this season to begin to ask God to show you fresh revelation. That he would begin to open your eyes. That maybe while you're reading the Bible, something would illuminate to you and you say, wow, I didn't, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. I didn't know I was supposed to go that way. Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 3 says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. I want you to begin to ask God, when's the last time that you actually prayed, God, would you show me what I should do? When's the last time that you said, I don't want to just do my plan God, would you actually show me what I should do with my life? Every January, I I, I bring a notebook uh, on 21 Days of Prayer, and and in the notebook, i got a a lot of things written in pencil. Or I've got them typed into a document that's easy for me to delete and rewrite some things. And every 21 days, I come to God with open hands and say, God, here's some of the things that I think we could do or where we could go. Here's just some of the things I feel like you're leading me to. And I leave room for God to erase some things and for God to write some things in marker. I leave some room for God to say, no, 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 this is what you're supposed to do. I want you to pray for revelation in this new season. In the early days when we were launching One Hope, we, uh, we actually had a number of our team say, hey, we're, we're going to be on the launch team. You know, there, there's nothing worse, though, than someone saying, I'm coming, but then they don't actually come. You know that? I, when someone says they're coming to the party, but then they don't arrive, kind of frustrating a little bit. We had some folks that were constantly saying, hey, we're going to move to New Orleans, and we're going to launch the church with you. And what I realized is that just leaving it like that wasn't the best thing. So I said to them, listen, before you decide, I really only need you to tell me one thing. Would you simply say that you believe God spoke to you to do this? Uh, Listen, when you're launching a new church, how many of y'all know warm bodies? You'll take all of them, right? Anybody wants to show up, you're going to say, count me in. Let's do this together. Uh, Hey, we're going to launch this. But for the team and the leaders, I said, I need to know that you believe God spoke to you to do this. Why is that? Because I knew there would be some days that it was harder than they expected. I knew some days that it was going to hurt more than they wanted it to hurt. And on those days, I didn't want them to say, well, Pastor Josh talked me into this. You know, he was a good salesman that day. He said, we're going to eat king cake every February together. And I was going to hang out at his house. And we're going to, no, 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 no. When it gets hard, you've got to say, no, no, God called me to do this. You're hearing this. You need to have a moment in your life when you're heading out like Moses facing the Red Sea that you know God told you to go there and to do that because when it gets hard, you know if God sent you, God will deliver you. Amen, everybody? If you know that God called you to do it, you know the one. He's going to be the one to provide for you. When this opportunity arose for us to to be a part of a great church in Bell Chase and to expand our ministry to two different places as a church family, I want you to know that I did not consider it an easy thing to do. And so we said, before we make any decision, our elders and our prayer team and our staff, we're going to walk the property in Bell Chase. We're going to look under everything. We're going to look for roof leaks and problems and issues. And we're going to pray because we want to know if God's calling us to do it 
what we're going we're getting ourselves into. That's I wanted to know, I wanted to know. And I asked our elders, I said, as we walk through this property, it looks like a good thing, it looks like a God thing. But for the next week, we're going to pray and fast together. And at the end of the season, would you each just, could we just talk before you talk with yourselves, would we each talk? And I want you to know that each one of our elders came back and said, we believe God has called us to do this together. When you know that God has revealed it to you to do, and you know that you don't have everything you need to do that very thing, you know you're right where God wants you to be. Because in my experience, God never asks you to do something that you have everything you need to do it at that point. If you can do everything God's asked you to do right now in your own strength, then probably it's not God's dream, it's probably your own. Because God's dreams and God's revelations, they push us out of our comfort zone and they challenge us to do things that we couldn't do on our own. And today I'm here to tell you that we're launching a new church in seven days. To God be the glory because we got a revelation from God because God provided because of your generosity, because of your care, because of your hard work. Amen, everybody. It's because we leaned into that. 1 Kings 4, 29 says that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Every day of my life, I whisper these words, God, give me wisdom, insight, and understanding. Would you say that with me? God, give me wisdom, insight, and understanding. One more time. God, give me wisdom, insight, and understanding. I don't want my reasoning. I want a revelation from God. I need God. I, you need God. Listen, the only way you're going to change is if God helps you to change. Here's the second thing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray for revelation. Next 20 days, praying for revelation. Second thing, I want you to repent in response to the revelation. Now, the word repent is one of those words that if you grew up in a church like I grew up in, whenever the pastor said the word repent, it was kind of like, get ready, it was going to be a hard message, right? It's going to be a little hellfire and brimstone coming your way, a little turn or burn, you better get right or you're going to get left by God, you know? It, it was a little harsh preaching coming in, but the word repent isn't a dirty word in your Bible. You know what it means? It just means turn to God. It just means stop, stop doing your own thing and turn to God. Turn to God's way of doing things. The Bible says that when Jesus heard Peter's revelation, he said, you didn't learn this from the books. God revealed this to you. And you're no longer Simon, son of Jonah. Today I call you Peter. And in one moment of revelation, God began to change who he was on the inside. As you study your Bible, it's in moments of revelation that we actually turn to God, that we become the people that God always intended us to be. Abram became who? Abraham. And Sarai became Sarah, right? And Jacob, who was a supplanter and a deceiver, became Israel, the prince of God. Uh, Saul, who was a murderer of Christians, became the apostle Paul. All in a moment, their lives changed because when they discovered who Jesus is and they repented, they turned to God, they changed. The Bible says in Galatians, uh, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 3 and 19, it says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance is simply turning your life toward God. It isn't always a sin issue that you need to stop. It could be something that you need to start. In Galatians chapter 2, the apostle Paul says this line, says, then after 14 years. If you read the verse, you just keep on going. It's like, oh, it's been 14 years. What happened 14 years prior to that is when the Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem the first time and people found out that he was the person who was attacking Christians but had now become a Christian and they all tried to murder him. So how many of y'all know that Paul wasn't visiting Jerusalem anytime soon, Right? It's kind of like some of y'all skipped Christmas with your families. You're like, I've been there. I've done that. I don't need the t-shirt again, right? He says, then after 14 years, 
I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. He's bringing the protection group, right? Uh, he, had some, he had some friends. Would you read the next line? Every voice, come on. I went in response to a... Let's say it one more time. I went in response to a revelation. Why did he go to the place that he had been avoiding for 14 years? Because God revealed to him that if he went back, he would actually find healing, life change. He would continue his purpose. Listen, church, you need God to give you a revelation. And you need to turn even into some of the uncomfortable things that he may be asking you to do. What do you need to change this year? What do you need to, to go to do in response to a revelation from God? What habits do you need to start? What habits do you need to stop? What things do you need to carry on into the new year? I believe that, that God is calling us to grow, not only numerically as a church, but God is calling you to grow spiritually. And in order to grow spiritually, you're going to need a revelation from God, and you're going to need to turn towards that revelation. You're going to have to do everything you can to turn towards God in this season of life. Here's the third. After you get a revelation and you turn towards God, I want you to run after God's revealed purpose. I'm going to help you to make sense of this because some of you are like, okay, isn't that similar to the number two? No, no. You know, since the beginning of time, God has been doing one thing. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, everything God did in the Garden of Eden was so that you and I would have a relationship with God. He showed his intentions when he gave us a beautiful garden with four rivers and no clothes. Come on, everybody. God showed his intentions were good. God's intentions were fun. God's intentions were exciting. That was what he planned for us. And then we kind of messed it up. Here we are. We get out of the garden. And what's God do? He tries to reveal himself to Cain and Abel. Cain goes the wrong way. Abel comes to God. Everything God's been doing, as you read the historical accounts all throughout your Bible, you discover that from the very beginning of time to now, God's been doing one thing. Trying to reconcile all of mankind to himself. When you get a revelation, you begin to turn towards that revelation. It's going to fit under the umbrella of what God has always been doing. Your New idea, if it takes you out of what God's always been doing, may be a bad idea. It's kind of like the guy who sat in my office one day and said, Pastor, I think I, think I missed God when I married that girl. I said, what do you mean you miss God? He said, I think she's the wrong one, and I have found the right one. I love when it gets quiet in church like this. I looked at him and I said, do you realize when, when you got married, according to the Bible, once you got married, that she became, that woman became God's will for you, regardless of what you might think about the new one? Some of y'all ladies are nodding your heads. Some of you guys are like holding your elbows real tight and straight right now. I looked at him and I said, you know, when, even when we make some mistakes, God redeems them under his umbrella of purpose. Even when we think we've done the wrong thing, God turns them for good. And I begin to talk to him about restoring his marriage and honoring God and, and building into the person that God had given you. are hearing this today. That when God reveals to you new things, they're going to fit under the things that God has always been doing. God is not going to tell you to lie. Amen, everybody. The three of you said that. Y'all know that lines in the Ten Commandments, right? God, God is not going to ask you to be deceptive. How many of y'all know murder is not something that God's asking you to do? Man, I tell you, this New Year church, y'all need to, you know, a little more Jesus right now. Right? Y'all okay? Listen, everything God is doing now, he's always been doing. And it all fits under that same umbrella. That's why in Matthew 28, he could tell you the very same thing that he told the church in Exodus. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I, will, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. When God saved you, he began a work of growing you into the person that he desires you to be. And as you lean into his calling in your life, as you lean in, which you discover that becoming all that God wants you to be isn't easy and you can't do it all in one step, can you? 
You ever tried to climb a mountain straight up? Anybody? Anybody? When, when I moved to Birmingham, I discovered what mountains were because we don't have them around here. If you want a mountain here, you've got to find a levee. Isn't that how it works, right? When I got to Birmingham, we bought a house in the middle of a hill, and the first time I tried to pull in the driveway, I almost lost the muffler of the car because I decided I thought I could just pull straight up the driveway. And it, what you learn is if you go on a slight angle, you don't drag the muffler. And if you back out on a slight angle, you don't drag the muffler. And it taught me a simple lesson that if you want to climb a hill, you don't go straight up. You go on a slight angle and you just gradually grow. This year, if you'll turn toward God, if you'll listen for the revelation of God, you'll grow a little. You go around the mountain a little bit, a little bit, and you'll come around and you say, oh, I've been here before. But this time you're 10 feet higher than you were last year. This year, you know, last year you were like, I don't know if I can tithe. This year you're like, God's blessed me so much, I can do abundantly more because I've grown in that favor. Last year I couldn't talk to those people in my family, but last year I forgave them. This year I'm going a little bit higher. You're hearing this? You find that you grow just a little bit as you go around the mountain. Every one of us is called to be in the house of God and to grow the house of God. That's why Colossians 1.28 says, we tell others about Christ. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. We're, we're doing everything we can that when God reveals something new, we're turning towards it and we're seeing how it fits under the umbrella that God has. Here's our last and we close. Number four. I want you to take spiritual authority over the revelation that God gives you. What do, I, what do I mean by that? The Bible talks quite a bit about spiritual authority and spiritual warfare. And if you're going to fast and you're going to push back your body, there's got to be a bit of a spiritual awareness that you begin to say, no, 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 I'm going to take authority over what God said. Because just like in the garden, when the snake came to Eve and said, did God really say that he was going to provide for you? Did God really say he had a purpose for your life? Did, did God really say he'd provide a spouse? Did God really say he'd heal your family? Did God, the enemy comes in and tries to twist things up and it's there that you've got to draw a line in the sand and you've got to take authority over your own life. Matthew chapter 16 Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So today, what are you prayerfully opening for your life? And what are you prayerfully closing out of your life? As we close today, what are you prayerfully saying, now nah, that doesn't belong? What are you prayerfully saying? I'm not have that addiction is not coming into 2024. Today, by the power of God, by revelation, and by my own repentance, I'm choosing today to prayerfully say, I'm not letting, letting alcoholism determine my future. I'm not letting a, a broken relationship determine my future. I'm not letting, and you begin to draw the line and say, No, no, I'm taking authority by the word of God over my life. I tell you what, you begin to walk in this authority, things begin to change. As the Apostle Paul said, he says, though we live in this world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Today's message, today's message isn't a milk message, y'all. It's a meat message. It's a maturing message. Some of you said for a long time, I want to grow. I want to learn more. I want to do more. You know how you grow? You get a revelation from God and you go do what God called you to do. No matter how it feels, no matter how hard it is, you pursue and you do what God has called you to do. Amen, everybody? This is what we do as we close today. Would you bow with me in prayer all around this room just for a moment? With every head bowed and every eye closed and bell chased and right here, if you're far from God, the greatest revelation you need is the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. 
If today you find yourself far from him, the Bible says you're one prayer away. You're one prayer away from him saving you and changing you. I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand. I I won't ask you to come to the front with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you today, would you whisper this prayer? Say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.